Dressed to kill or killed the dress? Well, changes are coming to what we call fast fashion. European regulators are introducing new standards requiring transparency on worker rights and product recyclability for clothing imported in the European Union. These rules might impact all fashion companies. So what needs to change? This is a conversation well worth your next few minutes right here on UBS Trending. Hi, everyone, and welcome to UBS Trending. I'm your host, Anthony Pastore, and here with my friend and amazing colleague, Amantia Muhadini, who's here probably m almost as frequently as I am. So thanks for having you back, Amantia. Good to see you. And it's a really interesting topic because everybody loves fashion. People are, you know, whether they're shopping for clothes for school or work or fun on the weekends, we don't really think much further down the road of where did this come from and what regulations maybe were in place for me to actually hold this piece of clothing in my hand. And it seems like from the introduction and the report that I read of yours is that changes are coming for the fashion and textile industry. And it's not just the European Union, it might impact all of us. So tell us what's going on here and why it matters so much. Of course, happy to. So in this month's Sustainable Investing Perspectives report, we're looking, among other things, um, at the EU's initial kind of steps towards implementing their new framework on sustainability um, and recyclability for textiles. So more specifically, the European Union Pro Commission has proposed new rules on harmonizing um, producer responsibility, which is a, t a lot of words just to uh, really imply that they are looking to have a standardization across all of the EU member states of um, the responsibility that fashion companies will have on human rights as well as textile um, kind of recycling and waste mm. if they're operating in the EU market, not just for their own operations. Many companies are just kind of pass through or they source from others, but really responsibility through the supply chain, which would have significant impact potentially. Right. So it's not just buying and selling in the European Union. It's wherever those clothes come from. If you're buying it in the US and mm -hmm. it was created in the European Union, somewhere in one of those countries, it could impact you here as well. Or also, if you, if the same company, let's say, is serving a European customer and a US customer and is sourcing from, let's say, Asia, mm -hmm. then this company will have, you know, the same supply chain, right? So, so if they're adjusting to the EU market regulations, then they have to adjust to everywhere. Um, why does this matter? Why do we look at the EU? As you're seeing in the chart here, data from the World Trade Organization points to the EU being the lar largest single importer of textiles in the world, that a little over 20%. Um, and so, again, these rules could have meaningful impact. Now, why else do we care about it, especially from a sustainability perspective? Well, if you look at the fashion industry, it is truly responsible for a lot of significant environmental impact. Um, in 2015, which is the most recent data we had available, the water consumption of the textile industry was about equivalent to one third of the water consumed on the European continent. Wow. So we think about water scarcity, then suddenly you really realize the big footprint here. It was also responsible for over 85% of total waste, again, according to the European Environment agency. So you see the need here that they, these regulators are having to push forward and accelerate some change. Yeah, and something like 10% of global carbon emissions uh, is also coming from textiles, which is part of that same yeah. data pool that you looked at. So this is not really a new conversation. This is something that's been going on for years. We've been talking about waste when it came to textiles, clothing, fabrics, etc. Um, and even in using the circular economy as the example, we talked about the reuse and reusing of textiles to create other things or thrift shopping or that kind of, you know, idea. Yeah. No, absolutely. And look, it's not new. And yet, in some ways, it is what's mm. new about this conversation is that um, with these rules coming into play and with consumers consistently still staying to survey providers, at least, that they're willing to pay a premium for more sustainable uh, kind of clothing and, and other consumer goods, um, then companies will are, are quickly trying to find ways to adjust. Mm. Uh, we're seeing that R&D in fashion companies still is low at, at kind of less than 7% 7 of R&D budget. Um, which means somewhere the change has to happen and a lot of these opportunities are tied to this kind of circular economy question. Um, also, again, I'm so focused on the EU, but really this is a global conversation. We saw that chart earlier about imports. If we look at a chart of exports, 
where... That's a different story altogether. It is a different story and it all ties together. It all That's connects, right? right? So, so if we look at places like China and, and other Asia-based countries, we see that they are actually uh, supplying over 50% of textiles just globally. And they're responsible for over 70% of textiles that are being imported in the European Union. So these companies will have to uh, show up with transparency, with stronger sustainability characteristics. And in some ways, for us as investors, it's important to find those ones that will have lower costs of adjustment. In other words, find those sustainability leaders, even in emerging markets, that we've talked about in other conversations. Right. It seems like a, it's like a big lift, in other words, for the European Union to set these regulations uh, or as, as standards, especially when you're dealing with other countries that don't have the same standards in place. So it'll be interesting to see how this plays out over time. So, And you mentioned investing, the investing side of this. How might it impact investors? Well, so for, for us as investors, we, we would need to look at three things. Firstly, how are fashion companies adjusting? Um, are they kind of looking through their supply chains? Are they changing their operations? Are they introducing circular fashion type elements to their product lines? Secondly, broadly in the circular economy, we see opportunities around both fashion as well as waste management, that other part of this story. And then third, if we think again about companies, um, especially in those emerging markets in this industry, we want to look for those environmental, social, and governance leaders as as those that will be best positioned uh, when these things, and, and you know, it's a when, not an if, right. start to actually kick into play. Right, as we know, the EU is proposing this, um, this extension to this um, alignment that they had in rules for textiles uh, from 2022. So it's, it, we'll have to wait and see what actually gets decided on. Sure. Hopefully we'll know in a couple of months, but at that point we'll have more to tell. Yep, that is right. Yeah, as always with these things. Amantia, thank you very much. Good to see you. Good to, ha good to see you as well. Yes, and by the <laughs> way, as, and I, I should tell everybody, the reason why Amantia is here every month is because she releases and publishes a, a sustainable investing perspectives piece. We always take one article out of the three that are in there. This time it happened to be Changes in the World of Fast Fashion. So you could take a look at that and you could find more information on the report and everything else coming out of CIO at UBS.com forward slash views. That is our insights page. You can also follow us on social media. Lots of content on our Instagram page at UBS Trending. You'll find content there that you're not going to find anywhere else, which we also find to be very exciting. So take a look at that. You can also check us out on LinkedIn, Facebook, X, formerly known as Twitter, and more. And if you have any questions about your portfolio or anything Monty and I spoke about today, make sure to talk to your financial advisor. Until next time, I'm Anthony Pastore. Have a great day, everyone. And remember to keep your eyes on what's trending. We'll see you soon.